Hello, and welcome to Disinfectant Efficacy Testing, a coupon carrier method presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Nelson Labs. My name is Mike Auerbach. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of American Pharmaceutical Review, and I'll be the moderator during today's event. This webinar will provide a general overview of disinfectant efficacy testing and will provide a detailed methodology to assist in designing coupon studies that accurately represent facility procedures. In addition, this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, click on the Ask a Question tab on the right side of your screen. Please take note, the right side of your screen also features an overview of this webinar and more information regarding our speakers. If you have a technical question during the event, click the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access additional webinar support. Finally, we encourage you to use the social media widgets beneath the webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. And now, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Prior to working at Nelson Labs, Aaron Zahn worked in the raw dairy industry focused on antibiotic detection and bacterial growth. Since joining Nelson, Aaron has directed clean room disinfection validations and antimicrobial effectiveness studies that meet the industry standard. Aaron holds an undergraduate degree in microbiology and molecular biology from the University of Wyoming. Adam Staples has worked for Nelson Labs for nearly 10 years. He has previously worked in the Sterility Assurance Group for nine years as a testing analyst and study director. Adam is currently working in the antimicrobials and filtration section, overseeing kill time, microbial growth, tissue log reduction, and disinfection validations. He received his BS in microbiology from Weber State University. Aaron and Adam, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Mike, for that introduction. So this slide right here is our presentation abstract. So this is going to be one of those slides that I will just read because it's going to cover what is our presentation today. So disinfectants must be qualified on the surfaces in a pharmacopoeial manufacturing environment prior to their use in the facility. So what we're going to be talking about today is building a study with robust parameters and avoiding common fit pitfalls that are critical to avoid. So we avoid these because we can get negative responses from regulatory agencies, and it can also impact our manufacturing environments and our clean rooms. So if we spend more time on a study design and development up front, which Nelson Labs can help with, you can save valuable resources in the long run. The goal of this presentation is to provide a general overview of disinfectant efficacy testing and to provide a detailed methodology to assist in designing coupon studies. These coupon studies should accurately represent facility procedures. We aim to provide insight into how the results of these coupon studies can be utilized to improve your contamination control procedures and overall give you an idea of what your procedure is doing at your facility and give you evidence to show that you are properly cleaning. So some key takeaways that we hope you get out of this presentation are first, if you should be performing a disinfection um, efficacy test validation. And we'll go over the reasons that you should be performing these from a regulatory standpoint and from a um, study design standpoint. And next, we're gonna go over the study design. So largely, I will be going over the method and basically explain the testing from point A to point B. And then I will pass it off to Adam, who will probably be talking a little more about study design and how it can affect your interpretation of the results and how it can affect the regulatory agencies that are looking at these validations. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little more about the interpretation of those results. So this study is going to give you data. And once you have that data, you're gonna to want to apply it to your current procedures to see if they're working or not, and to see if your procedures are properly leading to a clean facility. So, First off, we're going to just talk about some definitions. There can be some ambiguous terms in disinfectant testing. So we'll go over those and make sure that everyone's on the same page of what we're talking about. I'll go over those indications that you should be performing a disinfectant efficacy study and why they are required for certain facilities. I'll then move on to efficacy and what that means and determining what kind of efficacy you should be validating in your procedures. I will go over some viricidal claims and their concerns with the EPA 
And then I will finish up with talking about the test method and um, give you a general overview of what this testing looks like and give some microbiological um, insights into the testing. Then I'll pass it over to Adam and he'll be going over that study design. And this will be a little more high level and uh, really get into the things that are commonly missed into these um, validations and some implications if you are missing variables or if something was done improperly. So um, as I mentioned before, there is some ambiguous terms. So in general, you'll see disinfectant used as just a term that means the solution that you're using to clean your facility. But a disinfectant agent can be a very specific term used by USP. And so that is a chemical or physical agent that destroys or removes vegetative forms of microbes. So a disinfectant agent is something that's proven to kill um, those organisms versus a sanitizing agent, which you can see there above, is something that reduces the microbial life. So this would include fungi, viruses, and bacteria, but it's not necessarily going to kill all of them and it may leave some organisms behind. So it's a good general cleaning, uh, cleaning solution, but it's not as um, robust as a disinfectant agent will be. A virucidal agent is just something that specifically kills viruses. This would be when the viruses are outside of the host cells. And these can be general sanitizers, work pretty well for viruses, but you can get more specific uh, with what kind of agent you're going to use. And those three are all incapable of killing what we call a spore. So certain bacteria and fungi are capable of producing spores, which are very hardy forms of microbial life. And the ability to kill those is special and requires certain agents. So these um, type of dis uh, disinfectants are going to be your chlorine-based disinfectants and your hydrogen peroxide-based. And they're going to be expected to kill all vegetative uh, microorganisms. And this can be important when you're designing your validation because if you're expected to kill all vegetative organisms, it could affect the, uh, what, what challenges you're going to be giving to the sporicidal agent. And as I mentioned before, I called it coupon testing. So this is a term that's very common in the industry. And all it means is a small section of material that represents the surface that's going to be in your clean room or facility. The reason we call it a coupon is because it's about the size of a coupon you would use at the store. So it's gonna be about two inches by two inches, and it's gonna be a very thin section of material that's gonna come directly, hopefully, directly from your facility. And it'll accurately represent what this disinfectant is being applied to in your situations. So now that we kind of know what we're talking about here, um, let's go ahead and talk about what facilities are going to require a disinfectant qualification. So the FDA asks that efficacy of the cleaning and disinfecting procedures are validated if you are producing pharmacopial articles or parenteral drugs. So this is directly linked to 21 CFR parts 210 and 211. And so if you are manufacturing these things, it's expected that you have an aseptic environment or a sterile environment, depending on uh, the status of your clean room. And this means that you need to have evidence that shows your procedures where you are applying your disinfectants are going to work. Another situation where you might wanna look at performing a disinfectant validation is if they're going to be terminally sterilized. And while the FDA does not necessarily require a cleaning validation for um, facilities performing uh, medical device production, it's still important that you understand how you're addressing um, the bio burden and uh, microbes in your facility. And a disinfection efficacy validation can be super beneficial in providing evidence that you are um, controlling your environment, and controlling your contamination. So when we're talking about disinfectants, there's basically three phases where a disinfectant is um, qualified to kill microbes. So the first phase starts with the manufacturer. 
and they're going to obviously start with a chemical analysis of their product. That's going to show what ingredients are going to be present in the solution and what concentration that they're going to be at. It'll also usually allow them to provide a dilution um, example or dilution recommendation where you can have efficacy of killing or removing microbes. So this testing usually starts with liquid culture. So they'll usually have a test tube and that'll contain a certain amount of disinfectant. And then into that test tube of disinfectant, they will aliquot pure um, microorganism culture. This can also include serum or other um, interfering substances, which will show that even if your facility has let's say biologics that are getting um, deposited on these surfaces, that the disinfectant can still um, get past those and reach the microorganisms to provide that kill. With this type of testing, they're going to be able to provide contact times that are going to be the recommended time to get a certain amount of kill on certain organisms. So this is step one. This is usually done with the EPA to get a disinfectant um, registered. But what comes with phase two of disinfectant testing is the responsibility of the end user. So these would be your facilities and as the sponsor's uh, responsibility to show that while the disinfectant works in liquid culture, it also works on the direct manufacturer surfaces that it's being deployed on. And after you perform the satisfactory site audit of the disinfectant manufacturer to show that they're making this disinfectant in a clean, sterile fashion, then you're going to want to perform your disinfectant efficacy testing. And this is where Nelson Labs comes into play because we can grab your actual surfaces, just like you see here on the right, and test the organisms that we want to challenge directly on those surfaces and then employ your procedures. So the goal of this disinfectant efficacy study will be to validate your methods to provide evidence that your cleaning procedures are working and providing the proper log reduction required by agencies. Adam will be going over these recommendations for log reductions um, later in the study. But uh, I just wanted to say these tests can have a lot of different names and they uh, kind of all mean the same thing. So if you're talking about AOAC methods, they're gonna call it a carrier test, but you can also see lots of different methods seen there where this is called. Often in the, in just the casual lingo, we'll call it a coupon test. But at Nelson Labs, our official name for this type of study is testing disinfectant agents for antimicrobial action on hard surfaces. So now that we understand what this test is, let's talk about what kind of claims can be added. So virucidal claims are used for usually commercial or hospital grade um, applications. So the EPA has specific uh, methods that they want uh, virucidal efficacy validated to. Um, you can see here below is an EPA statement where they want the specific virus to be inoculated onto the surface, then dried, and then treated according to the product instructions. And if they get the proper log kill, then you can apply to that label of the disinfectant that you have virucidal efficacy and that is required um, by the EPA. So that method is tested um, according to a standard from ASTM 1053, which is listed here. And basically this is a standardized method so they know that disinfectants are um, basically being treated equally and they're being tested equally. So Nelson Labs can perform a large range of viruses um, in this testing. We have over 100 different kinds, including the hot topic right now, which is COVID-19, but many others, which um, provide a broad spectrum of viruses that we can test according to. And those are going to encapsulate the different kinds of viruses that I um, listed here. So a large amount of disinfectant efficacy testing will be according to USP chapter 1072, which is about disinfectants and antiseptics. Nelson Labs also highly uses PDA Technical Report 70. This is from 2015. And it outlines the process of disinfectant testing and kind of gets into the more nuances of it. And we use that document to help guide us in designing these efficacy studies. So below, you can see a picture of what the test system is starting to look like. We see sections of different material being um, 
being challenged by organism. And it's really important that these methods are standardized and that we follow recommendations from the USP. And um, the technical report from PDA is very essential in how we design these studies. Our validation method is very similar um, to the methods out there. It's based around AOAC methods, but specifically to your surfaces. But it's also very um, close to European standards, such as 13697, which if you need to understand what our method looks like, that's a very good um, example. So disinfectant efficacy testing, here are some indications that you should be performing these validations. So the biggest one is a new facility. So if you have updated a facility in, a, in an area, you're going to have to validate that your disinfectants are working on these new surfaces in this facility. So these could be updates just directly to the clean room, or these could be an entirely new facility. And when you move to a new area, something that's um, keen to think about is your environment is changing. So if you're used to manufacturing in a dry, arid, uh, arid environment, the type of microorganisms that you're going to be recovering in your environmentals that your personnel are going to be bringing in to the building are going to be very different from the microorganisms, let's say, from a nice, humid place um, in the south of the United States. So those organisms are going to change. And as your environmental isolates um, change in your EM program, you're going to want to make sure that your previous validations are covering those new isolates. And if you have a completely new facility, unless these surfaces are exactly um, as the ones before, you're going to have to perform the validation on these new surfaces to show that your disinfectant is in fact working. Um, I have an example here in the bottom right of a surface that obviously would never be in a clean room with all these cracks, but it's to kind of represent that surfaces are not always what they appear. And new surfaces can have new micro environments for organisms to hide in. And you'll want to make sure that when you're doing, you're assessing your surfaces, that you're taking into account that while they may appear the same, they can have tiny differences that can make a big difference in the efficacy of your disinfectant. Sometimes you will employ a new disinfectant. Um, and this could be because you um, didn't have access to the previous one or you would like to move towards a different disinfectant because it may damage your new facility. So if you're used to using hypochlorite, but in your new facility, it's full of steel, things that it can degrade, maybe you're gonna to wanna to move towards a uh, peroxide-based uh, disinfectant. And at that point, you're gonna to wanna to validate that uh, new solution on your surfaces. Sometimes you have discontinuations. This is a little more rare, but certain manufacturers will discontinue disinfectants based on new EPA findings. Adam will touch on this a little later when he talks about Vestine. So if your EM program identifies a new environmental contaminant, you ought to make sure that your validation addresses that new contaminant. So new personnel can bring in new organisms. Commonly what's seen in the clean room is gram positive bacteria. So these are shed from the skin and hair and you want to make sure that these are being addressed in your validation, because if you have a new personnel bringing a new type of gram positive bacteria, your validation may not cover that new bacteria. And then, as I mentioned before, if you're in a new area, you may have new spores, new molds, and you want to make sure that those are addressed. And then you also just have um, updates to your internal cleaning procedures or disinfecting procedures. So if you're going to change the way you apply your disinfectant, perhaps you have a new wipe, a new mop, or a new spray mechanism, or you could have a new contact time. If you need to reduce the amount of contact time the disinfectant has with the surface to, let's say, speed up a process, you're going to also want to validate that new contact time. Because if it's shorter than your previously validated one, you don't have evidence that you have efficacy um, at that time point. And you'll want to make sure that your um, validation matches what's happening in your procedures. This is critical. Um, Adam, of course, will talk about this later when he gets into the interpretation of results and interpretation of study design. And of course, the big one is if you receive regulatory action. 
So if the FDA has identified a gap in your study design um, when it's compared to your cleaning procedures, you'll want to address this as soon as possible. You want to make sure that you get your methods that you're using validated so that you don't have any downtime to your facility. And of course, just keeping a clean facility is important, um, not just for uh, regulatory action, but to the end user and um, the consumers of the product. You want to make sure that it's safe and that it's free of contamination. So now that I've kind of gone over why we would perform these studies, let's get into the testing. So anytime you're working with an antimicrobial, you want to make sure that your recovery method of that microorganism is validated. At Nelson Labs, we perform neutralization qualification. This is done according to USP Chapter 1227, where it talks about validating microbial recovery. So we have specialized neutralizers and methods to neutralize the, anti the um, antimicrobial and allow any organisms that have survived the disinfection process to be recovered and grown and enumerated. If you're unable to recover organism, you're unable to show what the actual log reduction is. The coupons and carriers are prepared for testing. These should be pre-cut when they are sent to Nelson Labs. They should be cut to a, a reasonable size. USP Chapter 1072 asks that they be around two by two, two inches by two inches. And that's because you wanna be able to actually apply the disinfectant in a realistic way. If you have a tiny coupon, it's very hard to employ, let's say a mop um, or a wipe just due to the size of the coupon and they need to be relatively matched. So we ask that you send those coupons properly cut um, from your um, facility once it's either being built or you will get those coupons um, after your facility has um, been built. And Adam will talk about the challenges in acquiring surfaces. So after we have the um, method validated and your coupons are prepared for testing, we will then inoculate a known concentration of challenge organism onto that coupon surface. Once that organism has been dried onto that surface, the challenge disinfectant is going to be applied according to your, your specifications. So we are going to follow the procedure that we have outlined um, and approved to accurately represent what's being done at your facility. We will allow that disinfectant to sit for a specified contact time and our test article, which in this case would be that coupon, is then placed into the neutralizing solution and the disinfectant would be deactivated. After we have deactivated the disinfectant, we're going to recover any organisms that have survived that disinfection process from the coupon. And it'll be either plated on auger or membrane filtered to enumerate surviving populations. They are incubated and we count them. And then we can make comparisons based on that known concentration that we inoculated with to see how much kill your disinfectant has displayed. This is going to give you that information to know if your procedures are working or if your environmental isolates are able to be killed by your specific disinfectant that you're employing your procedures. So now that we have an understanding of what the method is, the basic methodology and the microbiology, I'm going to pass it off to Adam who's going to be talking a little more about study design and the impacts it can have on your facility. Thank you very much for the introduction, Aaron. Uh, that was a great overview. So jumping right into it, environmental monitoring. Aaron touched on this a little bit when he was uh, talking about microorganisms, but something that is very important to make sure you're keeping track of when you're looking at these assays is the actual flora of your facility. Here at Nelson, we do have the ability to help either perform some of this testing if you are uh, unable to perform it yourselves, or in some instances, we can help you design uh, what your EM program can look like. And if this is something that you guys have an interest in, please do feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to help if we can. With the uh, study design, there's a few things that you definitely wanna be keeping track of as much as possible. Within this, the concentration of the microorganism that you're going to be applying to the coupon is going to really allow you to determine what level of kill you're able to achieve which, with each one of the surfaces with your disinfection process. The type of organism that you're going to be using is going to be correlating with the flora of your facility, as well as making sure that you have encompassed the possible kinds of life that you can see when you're going through your EM program, as well as common types such as spores, vegetative, 
or uh, something like a, a yeast. The concentration of the antimicrobial agent is also going to be important. As was mentioned, many times the C of A or the label that comes with these disinfectants will already have a predetermined dilution scheme that you can use. If you are choosing to adjust that, make sure that that is being accounted for when you guys are setting up your study. So if you're doing a 1 to, 20, 1 to 128 dilution, use a 1 to 128 dilution with your assay. Something to also keep in mind is the porosity and texture of the surface. So when you are looking at applying a, a liquid to a surface, if you have a high porosity on a surface, such as wood or a cinder block is an extreme example, there can be micro pockets inside of uh, the actual surface that will allow an organism to hide. Uh, and when a liquid is applied to the surface due to the surface tension of the disinfectant, it may not actually get inside of that small surface. So make sure when you're looking at setting up these assays and building out your facilities that you're accounting for the actual surfaces that you're using with this. Also, one of the important pieces to keep track of is the application method. So if you're going to be using a mop with your process and with the application of your disinfectant, make sure that you're actually using a mop when you're doing your disinfection test to apply it and make sure that it is a saturated wipe or something that is going to mirror your process as closely as possible. If you're going to use a mop uh, for your process, don't use a wipe. If you're going to use a wipe with your process, don't use a mop. With contact time, make sure that you are accounting for dry times as well as the active air inside of the environment. So if you have a contact time of five minutes, make sure that it remains wet for the full five minutes of that contact time. And if it does not, it needs to have a reapplication of that disinfectant to that surface to make sure that it's maintaining the contact time that is called out in your procedure to show the level of kill and to achieve the level of kill that you're hoping to achieve with this disinfection. With the expiration time, there are predetermined expirations on each one of the containers that comes from the manufacturer. Oftentimes, there is also a internal requirement that says X number of days after a bottle has been opened, we can continue to use this container uh, with the expiration times, you want to challenge and have data to support that at the longest hold time, so if you're saying it can sit for 10 days after it's open and you can still use it for that amount of time, at or beyond 10 days, perform the assay to show that you're still able to achieve that level of kill at that hold time. Aaron alluded to this a bit uh, earlier. So one of the things that can be very difficult with these coupon tests is actually acquiring the services to perform the assay. The easiest time to actually get them is, as Aaron mentioned, during the manufacturing of the facility or when you're doing your upgrades to the facility. It's possible to get them after the fact, but this is a common pitfall that people will run into when they are performing these tests is they don't have these services available to perform the test, or what they do have is insufficient, so the coupons might have to be recycled. Uh, something to also make sure that you're keeping track of is, again, the disinfectants and the applicators. For the testing, you want to, again, be keeping track of your environmental isolates, so a vegetative bacteria, a yeast, a mold, a spore-forming bacteria are the three general types that you want to make sure that you're encompassing and including with this disinfectant process. Something else to keep in mind is potentially uh, you'll have some, multiple times falling into each one of these categories. So if your EM program shows that you have a large number of bacillus uh, species popping up inside of your EM, you might want to use more than one spore forming bacteria when you're setting up your test to make sure that your disinfectant is going to be effective against the wide range that you can recover. Also something to keep in mind with this is the organism selection is going to really be drive, or driven by um, what you are recovering. So when you're looking at disinfectants to be qualified, if you're seeing a lot of gram positives, make sure that your disinfectant is going to be effective against gram positives. Again, just making sure that you are able to achieve that wide range of disinfection with the process and that your process is going to be effective at reducing any possible contamination or any populations that might be inside of your controlled environments. As I mentioned, uh, when you are setting up a, a program like this, you want to make sure that you are aware of what flora is inside of your facility. 
and that data comes from your environmental monitoring program. So if you are building out a new facility and you don't already have EMs uh, from another similar facility and in a similar location, AOAC does offer some guidance on common kinds of microorganisms that you can use from a common culture cell bank. So ATCC is the one that it uh, references, but you can use other cell banks if you have access to them. So with this, you can see that it is calling out a wide range. You have gram positive, you have a gram negative, you have a yeast, you have a mold, you have spore formers. Again, just making sure that you're trying to encompass as much as possible with these tests to make sure that you have a robust method that is going to allow you to have the assurance that your facility is cleaned to an appropriate level after you have performed your disinfection and sanitization. So surfaces is something that is a common question that comes up with these tests as well. When you are looking at what surfaces you want to be using with your test, it's best to encompass all of them from your critical environment whenever possible. If you're not able to include all of the surfaces from your critical environment, have a document of justification or something in place to defend why you've chosen the approach that you have. But again, the easiest way to prevent any questions from a third party reviewer or somebody that's coming in to qualify you is to make sure that you have included all of those surfaces inside of your disinfection and testing. So something that also comes up with these is FDA 483s. So I've added a snippet here from one of the 483s uh, that we came across while we were setting up this presentation. And it calls out specifically making sure that the critical surfaces were not accounted for inside of their study. And as a result, it raised a question with the FDA reviewer that was performing the inspection. And as a result, they have an FDA 43, which would lead them to have to have a response. So just this is added just to add emphasis to make sure that when you are assessing your surfaces, that you are looking at them as a fully encompassed approach and not trying to cut down on surfaces whenever possible, but also if you do have to, making sure that you have a justification in place to do it. So uh, within the testing design, there is a common approach of having three chemical antimicrobial agents that are rotated, and the frequency would be established by your internal procedure. Uh, we've added in a few common examples with each kind as a example. So 70% IPA is a sanitizer, uh, LPH or Vespine for a general disinfectant, and for sporicides, something like spore cleanse or decon spore. Uh, historically, it was a common opinion that there needed to be a rotation of these disinfectants to prevent antimicrobial resistance to these disinfectants. Over time, we have found that this isn't necessarily the case with sanitizing agents. Uh, there, it's no longer held as a common belief that you would even have to rotate out one of the disinfectants to prevent any kind of resistance from building up in your population. To add further emphasis to this, uh, here is a snippet from PDA, uh, TR70. And the point that I want to emphasize with this one is bullet point number three. So with antibiotics specifically, there are very defined and limited options for how that antibiotic will get into the cell and potentially kill it or inhibit its ability to grow. With a sanitizing agent or a disinfectant, it has a wide range of pathways that it will attack in the cell, which would allow it to account for any potential uh, mutation or evolution of a cell that would limit its ability to cut off a pseudo pathway for the microorganism to adapt to the uh, sanitizing agent. So as a result, if you're using something like spore cleanse and you've been using it for five or six years, you don't have to change from using spore cleanse just because you've been using it for a long period of time. If you're seeing issues with EMs, it might be worth looking at something like your contact times, and you could look at using a different spore side, but it's not necessarily going to be required. Something that could be easier is just increasing the contact time with that disinfectant. So something also with disinfectants is there will be certain uncertainties with the production and accessibility of disinfectants. Uh, these last few years have definitely brought into light the limitations of supply chains and always the accessibility of all the items that we have come to expect to see available at any given time. For example, one item that was mentioned by Aaron is Vespine. So Vespine went through a update due to some 
uh, observations from EPA that it was having a adverse effect on the environment, and as a result, the formulation changed slightly. So when you're looking at these disinfectants, it doesn't hurt to have a bit of redundancy built into your process to account for an unexpected update to a disinfectant. If there is going to be a change to the disinfectant, so the formulation such as what happened with Vestine 2 and Vestine 3, you need to make sure that you're revalidating your process to account for those changes and make sure that your process is still going to be applicable with the updated formulation. In some instances, I know that a lot of people ran into issues with even getting access to some of these disinfectants while they were trying to uh, move into the updated formulation. And again, just to emphasize this, this is where that redundancy could come into play. So if you have qualified another disinfectant that you could introduce into your rotation, when something becomes unavailable, you have a fallback plan. It gives you the ability to easily flex into that and not have to scramble and potentially have uh, risk assessments and justifications in place for why you're modifying your process without having supporting evidence to go along with it. So this slide provides you an example of the information that we're generally looking for when we're setting up a new uh, coupon study. So with this, you can see three good examples of uh, a disinfectant, a sanitizer, and a sporicidal agent and information that can be correlating with them. So you will notice that the organisms that are called out are going to be different for the IPA and the pesticide compared to what's being used for spore cleanse. Also, you will notice that the expiration hold times are going to be a little bit different. So you want this information, again, to mirror what information you're using and what data you're needing to gather to support your internal process. So if you're having a expiration hold time of 14 days after a bottle's opened, challenge it at or beyond 14 days to show that at that amount of time, you're still able to achieve the log reduction that you're looking for. Like Aaron had mentioned, if there is soiling that is building up inside of your process, use a soil. Uh, we can use a bovine serum or something similar to that inside of this challenge to make sure that uh, the disinfectant is still able to achieve its end purpose, which is the reduction of a population of microorganisms over a period of time with a set contact time. With these surfaces, you also want to make sure that you are uh, targeting the disinfectant appropriately. So if the disinfectant's not going to be used on all the surfaces inside of your critical area, you don't need to use the disinfectant on all of those surfaces. Also something to keep in mind is these assays can get to be kind of expensive. So if you're looking at ways that you can potentially reduce costs but still get the same amount of data, uh, and the data that will give you the information that you need, you can look at using a worst case contact time as opposed to uh, potentially just the shortest period. So here you will see a couple of snippets from PDA TR70 and USP 1072. There are a couple of differences that are worth mentioning with these. The first table shows a log reduction of greater than one log versus the USP 1072 log reduction, which is showing greater than three and greater than two, depending on the kind of organism you're dealing with. So with the PDA document, it does correlate with the amount of time that the disinfectant would have contact uh, with that surface, as opposed to the overall log reduction that you're seeing from USP 1072, which is showing that you need to have X amount of kill from X amount of contact time. Something to keep in mind with this is a one log reduction that equates to the uh, about 90% of the population being killed off. So here you will see with a three log reduction, you're looking at about 99.9% .9 of the entire population being reduced at that point. Here is another snippet from USP 1072, which further outlines some of the differences that you'll run into when you're looking at a laboratory test versus a, a a population that you would typically find inside of a cleaner environment. So within our testing, our organisms would be healthy, well-fed, uh, potentially uh, in the growth phase, uh, depending on if it's a sport or not. Within your populations inside your clean room, most likely they're not going to be in a very similar state. So there will be some differences between what you would expect to see from organisms that are freshly grown versus populations that have been inside of a classified environment. So the acceptance criteria and the evaluation of results portion. This is where this testing really starts to come into play. You can really see how effective your uh, study design has turned out. One thing that is important to emphasize with this is if you are 
we're looking to get a, a very broad approach to when you're setting up this uh, study, make sure that you're targeting it correctly. So what I mean by that is, is you wouldn't want to target IPA with a three log reduction for an endospore. If you do target it, the odds are you are not going to achieve that log reduction. So there can be questions that come about from that. You would have to uh, really just look at your process and make sure that you're using the right organisms on the right surfaces for the right amount of contact times and that the expectations are uh, applicable and really going to mirror the process that you're looking for. Uh, the snippet that I added right here at the bottom is another piece of an FDA 483 where they're calling out that the uh, processes in the areas have not been validated to show cleaning and disinfection process consistently perform as expected. So again, just adding emphasis to the point that when you're designing these tests, make sure that you're able to select the organisms and the surfaces correctly so that you're able to get the data that you need to support your cleaning process as being effective. Here is another example of an FDA 43, where you can see that they targeted for some higher criteria than is called out in USP 1072. And unfortunately, they were not able to achieve it. And as a result, uh, FDA is still adding comments to a 43 about their disinfection process and asking the C4 how effective the process really was when they're still seeing uh, recoveries within their uh, facility. So. With this testing, uh, I've listed out a few common errors that pop up. I, I again want to reemphasize that uh, some of the things that can slow down these tests are going to be the acquisition of coupons. So if you are able to procure those during the retrofit or the rebuild of your clean room or during the initial building, it definitely makes this process go much more smoothly. And making sure that you have assessed within your process the uh, surfaces that are going to be critical and most important that they get tested and challenged with this uh, within this assay. You want to again be making sure that you are using a very broad range of microorganisms. Whenever possible, using an EM isolate as opposed to a stock culture from uh, a cell bank such as ATCC, just to make sure that you are challenging the actual flora of your facility against this test to make sure that it's going to work as you're expecting. If you've already performed a disinfectant study, it might be worth going back and relooking to make sure that your EMs and the organisms that you selected originally are still going to be applicable to what you guys are still seeing. So if you find during your assessment that you are seeing a new kind of microorganism pop up, it could be worth taking a look at your disinfectant coupon study or your disinfection study to make sure that you're able to account for those. And if you choose to, we'd be more than happy to help with reperforming that testing. Something else that can lead to some issues with these testing is going to be exposure times. So if you call out a five minute dwell time with a disinfectant and you're not getting the level of kill that you're expecting when you get your final results, really looking at the a test method to see if you're actually seeing five minutes of wet contact time with that disinfectant on that surface could give you an indicator of if there was an issue with either the coupons running out, so then you would know if you have to uh, make sure you're reapplying it uh, inside of your facility and basically making sure that it is able to mirror the process as closely as possible and what you're wanting to see from these results. With this, uh, something else to keep in mind is uh, if it doesn't align correctly, then the data that you've generated from this testing is not going to really give you the supporting evidence that your process is doing what it's supposed to. So just make sure, again, that your process that you're using within these disinfection coupon studies is the process that you're going to be using within your facility. So this is a list of the references that we have uh, for our presentation and uh, some additional contacts that you can reach out to if you do have any other questions about any of the other services that we can offer from out our business uh, or any of our other business units. At this time, I will turn it over to questions. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, Aaron and Adam, for your excellent presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that you could submit any questions you have for our presenters in the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. So now let's take a look at our questions. Our first question is, what sampling size criteria is recommended for these types of studies? 
Hi there. Um, good question, Wendy. Um, generally, we see these done in triplicate. So we would have three replicates of each surface against each organism and disinfectant. Um, there can be some variability with this type of surface testing. So we make sure to do three replicates to uh, get that good average and get accurate results. Excellent. Thanks for your answer. Let's take a look at our next question. Uh, our question is, my log reductions are not what I was expecting. How do I proceed? Also a great question. So with these, what you would want to do is take a look at the testing methods that were done, see if there were any errors that had occurred, uh, any improvements that could be made, and potentially look at extending out uh, contact times. Excellent. Thanks again for your answers. Uh, moving on, our next question is, what are your thoughts on surfaces that are common to numer numerous bio and pharmaceutical facilities, such as 316 stainless steel or, or glass? Is there value in every facility performing DE testing for a widely used disinfectant, such as Vesphine, versus staph species on stainless steel? It's really going to come down to the risk assessment for those facilities. Um, if they're in a, you know, a nearby region, and the type of isolates that are being recovered are very similar, and the type of environments in those facilities are very similar, um, there could be a risk assessment that um, makes it so you don't have to validate that, but that will have to come down to uh, your specific facilities. Okay, thank you. Let's take a look at our next question. I want to validate the shorter contact time for our procedures. Is that too much of a risk, and will it pass? So with these, there's a few approaches you can take. Uh, you could do what's called a, a kill time study to essentially assess uh, how long it takes the disinfectant to kill off whatever environmentals and the control organisms you want to use with that testing. If it's showing that you can get good kill without the surface, you could then move on to doing a coupon study to show that even when uh, the organism is on that surface, you're still able to meet the log reduction at a shorter time that you're looking to see. So really, it's a couple of steps that be involved with that process, and passing or not will really just depend on what you're looking to lessen uh, and the specific criteria around that. All right. Our next question is, we were told that we should not retest the organisms that the disinfectant manufacturer has already tested. Should we only test in-house isolates? So that's a good question. Uh, from our experience, what we've seen from uh, FDA is that they still expect to see uh, outside of the EMs as well to be challenged. So if there is already data with it from the manufacturer, usually that's not going to be necessarily on your surfaces. So I would still recommend that you are challenging those uh, to make sure that you are getting the assurance that on your surface with your contact time, with your application method, you can get the kill that you're looking for. Thanks for your answer. Uh, our next question is, how do I know something is an equivalent surface? If the surface kind of looks like it, can I use it? So this has to be um, a good analysis of the surface. So you're going to want to um, check with the manufacturer, um, make sure that the um, manufacturing process is the same, that it's the same grade of material. And um, this will have to be up to you to decide if a surface is equivalent and you will have to provide the proper justification for that a safe way to go would be if if there's not complete confidence that the that it's the exact same surface that you 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 validate um, your disinfectant um, on that surface okay and again thanks for answering that question let's take a look at our next question um, <clears throat> is it a regulatory requirement to validate disinfectants using environmental monitoring isolates when environmental monitoring identification data is always available? So I would say definitely take a look at what you are seeing from your EMs and if what you've already used is still going to apply for uh, the floor that you're commonly seeing with your facility. Uh, the assessment that you can do internally will really drive if you want to reassess using new EMs or if what you've already challenged with will give you the assurance that you need. Okay. Thanks again. Let's take a look at our next question. Thank you, Adam and Aaron. Very well presented. Question, why would you test a sporicidal agent such as spore cleanse against vegetative microbes such as Staphylococcus species? 
So um, in general, a sporicide is going to um, be expected to kill vegetative organisms. And if you were looking to have a validation that um, doesn't include um, the sporicide acting against those organisms, you could justify that you don't need to show that data as long as you have um, data for your other disinfectants or sanitizers and show you can get a um, good log reduction on those organisms. But of course, you can also have redundancies in these tests to show that your disinfectant becomes unavailable or it expires, that your spore cleanse does indeed um, kill those organisms. But generally, it is expected that a sporicide will provide that log reduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, I believe that's all the questions that we have today. We'd like to thank Aaron Zahn and Adam Staples for sharing their knowledge with us and also offer a special thank you to Nelson Labs for sponsoring today's event. Please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to view this webinar on demand and to share with your colleagues. Thank you for attending today's webinar and please enjoy the rest of your day.